negative Cause I just wanna hear it out your mouth, yeah Give me fuel, it's a tool that I use To go ahead and run my mouth, yeah I take shots, I take loss, I make shots, I miss lots I tell you get big boss, you get yachts You swing lots and pop off a big shot Welcome friends. In this episode, I am working on the interior of the Jeep, including the seats, carpets, lighting, electronics, and HVAC. This took place all throughout the three months I was fixing up the Jeep, so you'll see the Jeep in various levels of completion. The first thing that I started working on was replacing the two interior door panels because both passenger panels were damaged when I got the Jeep. These are an easy swap once I found the newer ones at the junkyard. I kept the original handle inserts in the rear because it was, in, it was just in better shape. But I couldn't swap out the front inserts because they have a plastic rivet process which holds the front handle in place. Once the appropriate handle was secured, I was able to transfer over the trim clips so that the replacement panel had a full set. Then I reinstalled the door panel by connecting the window wiring, the lock, and handle actuators, popping in the trim clips after removing the old ones that were still left in there, and reinstalling the screws. There are two screws in the rear, one cross tip and one torx screw. The front has three total with two cross tip and one torx. Next, I installed the OEM radio I picked up from the junkyard, and to my surprise, it was not working. This was likely because of the ignition cylinder issue that I figured out in episode 2. After installing the radio, I removed the gauge cluster to fix and upgrade the dash lights to LED. I already had most of the trim out of the way, which required a 10mm socket and a Torx bit, so all I had left to remove was the upper and lower cross tip screws, pull out the cluster, and unplug it. The previous owner had already installed the blinker stock for automatic headlights and fog lights, so all I had to do to get the automatic headlight function working was to install the sensor in the dash. I pulled out the old interior windshield trim, found the wire behind the gauge cluster, and routed it up to the sensor location. There are already screws in position, so I pulled those out, installed the junkyard sensor, and tightened it down before installing a new junkyard windshield trim. The rubber from the old trim was in the way, so I had to pull that out first before clipping down the new one. I had to be very careful during this installation of the, uh, the trim piece because it's very easy to bend and break the tabs which secure it into the dash. The Jeep did not come with a keyless entry fob, so I bought a Dorman one and tried installing it pretty early on in the build. It did not work because I had multiple electronic items disconnected from their modules, including the keyless entry sensor, which is actually located in the passenger door. I ended up swapping the keyless entry module with a newer one from the junkyard that had an external antenna, and the fob programmed right away. The range still isn't that great, but a more powerful fob, or I even thought about soldering a longer shielded wire, which was stripped at an appropriate length for 315 megahertz, and throwing that up in the roof liner. If you don't do one of those things or have one of those things, then it isn't going to get any better. The driver airbag was all gooey, likely from interaction with the chemical protectant, but you can't just buy another one because it's part of the airbag and it's illegal to sell those secondhand. I found a YouTube video where a guy used Goof Off, not Goo Gone, but specifically Goof Off to clean the surface before adding your own protectant. This actually worked really well. This next part I actually had to do on all four doors and on the rear hatch. The rubber seal for the doors seems to have shrunk and the corners were leaking water into the cabin. On a couple of the doors, a previous owner had used black silicone to try and seal it. Um, that obviously didn't work, and I was able to fix the issue by just adjusting the rubber to create a gap at the bottom and pressing the slack into the corners for a good seal. Next, I needed to replace the window motor and regulator on the rear driver window. This had been replaced before, and I'm not sure why it failed again other than maybe a water leak. I did buy this regulator and motor new instead of getting it from the junkyard because I wanted to make sure that it definitely worked. The first thing I did was tape up the window and remove the door card. And then 
I found a bit of wood in the door which was holding up the window. I started to unbolt the regulator but realized that I would need to first disconnect the window from the regulator. So I dropped the window down a bit, removed the left securing clip, and I had to remove the speaker to get to the right securing clip and pull that out. Then I could tape the window back up and start unbolting the regulator and motor using a 10 millimeter socket. After removing the old regulator and motor, I installed the new one and bolted it into place. I then connected the door wiring, dropped the window to into position, Move the regulator and window to a good height and reinstall the clips. I will say that I had to pull this panel off a few more times because the speakers were aftermarket and they weren't wired properly and because the panel kept popping off. So I had to buy different clips to secure it properly. So up until this point, most of what I've been doing was mechanical or electrical in some way and the Jeep was pretty gross. So I started cleaning up the interior beginning with the cargo area and since I was already there I installed the LED resistors and the LED light in the cargo dome light. I got this kit from Nodger Off Road's website and just followed his instructional videos for the installation. Then I moved on to the cabin proper cleaning up and installing LED bulbs. The driver's seat cover was torn and the cushion was falling apart. Additionally, the electric motors would not move the seat up and down, only front and back. I pulled out the front seats using a 15 millimeter socket and impact wrench and disconnected the power seat, which had one of those annoying red clip connectors. Once the seat was out, I began disassembly, which requires a cross tip screwdriver 13 millimeter socket, heavy duty wire clippers, and a pair of pliers. The screwdriver is to remove the plastic trim. The 13 millimeter socket is for the bolts which hold the upper frame to the lower frame, and the clippers and pliers are for bending, cutting, and or removing the wire which secures the fabric to the cushions. I also disassembled a matching passenger seat that I found at the junkyard, marking positions where I would need to cut the cushion and cover to fit onto the driver's side as a replacement. After knocking out the driver's seat, I decided that it was easy enough to disassemble the seats and I figured that I would just do the passenger seat and the back seats also. I removed the rear seats using a 10 millimeter and 18 millimeter socket, ratchet and impact gun. Disassembly of the rear seats is a whole lot easier uh, since they just use a lot of plastic clips, rivets, and Velcro to hold on the covers. However, the bottom portion of the seats do have a couple of those metal bars that you're gonna have to mess with. Those are a huge pain. I tried lubing up the tracks on the driver's seat, but found out that the motor gears were a common failure point since they were just made of plastic. I grabbed another seat from the junkyard and even tested it there, but upon disassembly when I got home, I found out that both motors on the junkyard seat were also broken. So jumping ahead, I decided to get replacement motors from a company called Two Men One Garage. There are a few companies out there, including this one, that sold replacement metal gears, but you know that wouldn't guarantee any longevity or operation of the motor. And the price difference and extra labor made the full motor assembly with metal gears way more economical in my opinion. 
Swapping out the motors is still a chore and I ended up using a screwdriver, vice grips, and a hammer to knock out the pins since I didn't have punches at this point. Then I used an angle grinder to cut off the threaded rod from the old motors and cut a notch in the top for a flathead screwdriver. And then I unscrewed the threaded rod from the nut sleeve, which I could then install the nut sleeve onto the new motor and threaded rod by just, you know, screwing it on there and then knocking in the retaining pin for the completion of the assembly. After transferring the nut sleeve to both new motors, I could reinstall the motors and punch in the pins. Afterward, the seat was working great. The driver's seat falling apart was due to old age, but it was also due to a design issue since the support springs are lower than the outer edge of the seat. This allows for the cushion to rest entirely on a narrow strip of metal and wear down over time. I decided to add a couple of springs borrowed from the spare seat and move the springs up higher by drilling new retaining holes to prevent the extra wear on the new cushion in the future. Off camera, I found that washing the seat covers was not enough and decided to use black writ dye on the seats to try and remove some nasty stains. This was moderately successful and after the seats dried, I also coated them with a protectant to resist future stains. I had to remove the carpets on my Raptor to install vinyl flooring and I figured it would be an easy task in the Jeep so I could clean the carpet without worrying about damaging any of the electronics that are beneath the carpet. The carpet is in two sections, the cabin and the cargo area. I used a cobalt step bit in the rear to drill out the rivets which secured the cargo hooks to the floor and also held down the carpet. Then I removed the seat hardware and pulled the carpet right out. The front carpeting contains the underseat air ducting which had to be unclipped from the driver and passenger foot wells before removing. I used Resolve Carpet Cleaner and a pressure washer to get out all the dirt and stains from the carpets. I need to mention that this is likely the easiest way to clean extremely dirty carpets, but it was a huge hassle in the end because the carpet and padding is all one piece with a plastic sealer underneath all of that. That means that even after letting it dry in the sun all day, the padding was still soaked with water and I had to try and separate the carpet from the padding and keep it under a fan uh, inside the house all for, you know, it, it took about a week to get everything as dry as I was comfortable with it being dry um, in order for reinstallation. Of course, I was glad that the carpet was out for a long time because if it wasn't, then I would not have noticed that the AC condenser was leaking into the passenger foot well. This is a common issue since the drain just sticks out of the firewall and doesn't point downward. Uh, a bit of hose from AutoZone and a hose clamp uh, fixed that issue for me. While the carpet was out, I also sanded down any rust that was in the spare tire area, painted it, and installed the oversized spare tire, which barely fit. The seat cushions were all still 19 to 20 years old, so there was still some damage that I wanted to try and fix using the Right Stuff Gasket Maker and extra internal seat fabric. I've used this gasket maker for various applications in the past, and I was hoping that the flexibility and adhesive qualities could provide additional tear resistance to the seats. But this was just a giant mess. It was worth a shot, but I don't know how effective this was. Off camera, I painted all of the seat frames with chassis paint so that there would be a rust-free surface for reassembly. I made necessary cuts to the driver cushion before reinstalling the seat cover and conducting reassembly of the seat. This process was awful and took me over 90 minutes for each seat. Um, this being one of the main reasons that it just took me forever to finish the Jeep in the first place. I did not want to do this for any of the other seats.
I had a very dim ABS light on and the cruise control still wasn't working, so while I had the carpet out, I checked the sensors in the rear to make sure that I didn't damage them during the rear axle swap, but they were good to go. This was also where I noticed that the uh, parking brake was improperly adjusted and I fixed that back in episode four. I lost the footage for the center console removal and front carpet install the same time I lost the transmission footage. I did use fabric adhesive to reconnect the padding to the carpet while I was laying it back in, but the, the rear carpet reinstallation was a little more challenging because I had to clear out the old rivets and use larger rivets to reinstall since the stepped bit that I used caused some damage while I was taking it out. I coated both the front and rear carpet with protectant to try and resist any stains. When I started driving the Jeep, I noticed that there was an issue with the AC blowing warmer on the passenger side, and after checking the refrigerant level, I attributed the issue to the blend door nearest to the heater core, since this was a common issue. I bought a blend door repair kit and a butane heat tool and got to work. After removing the glove box and trim, I removed the motor and cut out the required outer and inner sections. Then I removed the actuating bar and the blend door before replacing them with the new metal parts. The problem I had with reinstallation is that the new actuating arm did not align with the motor, and I could not get the motor to operate after taking it apart and adjusting its position. I ended up running to O'Reilly's and replacing the motor with a new one, which worked perfectly. Another issue that I figured out while driving the vehicle was that the rear speakers were not working. This vehicle had aftermarket speakers and the wiring was pretty awful. The connections were bad on the passenger side and on the driver's side they actually crimped the connector directly to the insulation instead of a stripped wire. It finally started feeling like the Jeep was done, so I needed to start reassembly of the trim. This was harder than I expected because it had been nearly three months since I took it apart and I just had a cup holder full of different screws which I needed to figure out where each of them went. One of the wires going to the head unit was melted, probably from a previous owner's sound system, and I thought that I could just pull out the wire, replace it, and reuse the single pin connector. But the wire insulation was melted into the whole multi-pin connector. So I had to make a trip to the junkyard, cut out a new connector, individually pull out the pins from the old harness and connect them into the new multi-pin connector. Then I could splice that one damaged wire and plug in the pin. My goal was to drive the Jeep at least 300 miles before delivering to my mother since I needed to flush the seafoam out of the engine and find any additional issues. I think it's terrible how technology wants very quickly become needs when you're accustomed to using them. I wanted and needed a backup camera and Apple CarPlay so I installed an aftermarket head unit after watching Tyler Potter's YouTube channel. I was glad to find it because other head units usually remove the analog volume knob and that was a 100% need for my mother. Direct installation was simple since there was an adapter, but the additional connections were a little confusing to include the wiring the camera power, which requires an accessory signal that I got from the 12 volt sockets. I also ran the GPS antenna to the dash and microphone to the driver's side A pillar. In about 30 minutes, I was set up on wireless CarPlay and playing music. At this point, I realized that the driver tweeter was blown and the passenger tweeter was about to go, so I ordered some new ones before running the backup camera and microphone wiring. The only issue that I had with this setup is that if you dim the interior lights all the way down, the head unit lights will start flashing. The aftermarket tweeters were significantly different design, but they were direct fit and they are working great now. At about two weeks out from delivery, most of the exterior was complete, so I began finishing up the last interior details, including reinstalling the cargo area trim, reinstalling the shifter, which I did an epoxy and zip tie repair on, 
adding USB input to the head unit and running it to the glove box, reinstalling the center console, and then finally getting in the seats. Before installing the rear seat, I had to fix a damaged nut, which was on the back side. Uh, this was a really tight area, so I did a bad job, but I got the nut tacked in and was able to install the rear seats. The seats got surprisingly hairy during reassembly and my dog kept sitting on them so I did a quick vacuum and then I installed the front seat before finally installing the last of the interior trim in the cargo area. This last little bit of the video is just a run through of me swapping the dash lights to LED in the gauge cluster, EVIC module, and the HVAC module. I followed Nodger Off-Road's DIY, but some units may vary I guess, and I, I ended up having to test it and found some lights which were incorrectly polarized. The light adapters were also a little undersized or oversized depending on the application that they were going into so it was a little challenging to do the install. Overall I feel like the LED upgrade is a must-have for clear and easy to read gauges and they're they're not expensive at all so it's definitely worth it. Alright so expenses for this episode were pretty substantial because I went a little overboard. The HVAC expense was for the blend door repair and the cabin air filter that you'll see in the next episode. The door expense was for the replacement door cards and new window regulator. The electronics expenses for the interior light kits, upgraded EVIC module, a wireless phone charger, the new tweeters, a backup camera, which you'll see in the next episode, and the most expensive part was the aftermarket head unit. The seat and floor expense is for the Scotch Guard that I use on the seats and floor, as well as the front and cargo floor liners, the junkyard replacement seat, and the new motors to fix the driver's seat. I didn't show it in this episode because the last week of the build was a whirlwind, but I also bought a cheap sew-on leather steering wheel cover that I installed also on top of the goof-off uh, that I used for cleaning the airbag cover. That brings the episode total to $1,124 and the project total to $10,638. I had 18 hours of video, but I also lost some footage and I did a lot of off-camera work, so I just added the 20 hours into the project total. My first takeaway from this episode is that junkyards are awesome. They provide you with a cheap alternative to buying new parts. They allow you to upgrade internal parts like auto dim rear view mirrors, the automatic headlights, and the memory EVIC modules. But they also give interior plastic parts a second chance before getting tossed into the landfill. My second takeaway is that keeping a project for too long will allow for some scope creep. Initially, I thought that I'd just clean the interior and fix the driver's seat, but that turned into a massive project where I removed the entire interior and uh, it, it got expensive and took more time than I intended. My last takeaway is that 2003 model year vehicles can still have a lot of technology in them. The Jeep is a great example of that. You know, you have power windows, power locks, power seats, tire pressure monitors, automatic headlights, automatic wipers, uh, and the vehicles are old enough that you can also find nice aftermarket parts to add cameras and CarPlay. So that is it for this episode. I apologize for the long break. Now that the Jeep is actually gone, I've kind of lost some motivation, but I've got new things in the works, so hopefully I'll be able to focus more on editing also. Next episode should be the last proper project episode, which is focused on all of the repairs I need, needed to do for the exterior. Thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.